Hey, welcome to this video on 3D graphics in the browser. My name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley. In this video, we'll be completing our little mini series. The first video was on boilerplate setup in WASM introduction. The second was on two dimensional graphics and allowed me to introduce you to some basic graphic concepts. As a reminder, this is the pattern we created in the two dimensional video. And this is what we'll be building in this video a 3D sine wave that you can move with your mouse. The final project can be found on GitHub at this following location. I want to mention that these two resources are fantastic in learning WebGL. They're not Rust specific, but they do explain WebGL topics very well. When we discuss shading 3D objects and lighting techniques, the Mozilla tutorial was the foundation of what I'm presenting in this video. I encourage you to take a look at both sites if you're interested in learning more about WebGL. Three-dimensional graphics. The conceptual steps I want to take are first to create a grid on the XZ plane. You can think of that like the floor underneath your feet, not the vertical walls of your room. So when we add our Y values, we'll be able to see it rising and falling from the XZ plane. Next, I want the ability to rotate our graph, so we'll hook up our mouse events to do that. At that point, we should be ready to add our Y values. For fun, we'll put some coloring on the graph based on the height at every point. It will give an interesting effect, but really, to enhance our 3D feeling, I'll color the graph based on simulated light. We'll want it to be lit up as if there was a light source such as the sun. That will give it a much more realistic feel. Okay, let's do some damage. Picking up where we left off from our last video, let's create our shaders since they're probably the easiest. I'll start with the vertex shader. We're going to pass in some position information. We'll also pass in a projection matrix. This will do all the heavy mathematics for us via linear algebra. I'll also create a variable to transfer color down to the fragment shader. Hey, I thought the fragment shader was supposed to do our color calculations. This doesn't belong here. Well, the fragment shader can do all sorts of calculations to create cool effects. But if you can perform a calculation higher up in the pipeline, you can save a lot of calculations. For example, a single triangle may have hundreds of pixels. If the triangle color calculations are able to be done up in the vertex shader, then you can bypass hundreds of calculations per triangle. Really, to gain speed, it's all about bypassing the need for calculation. By moving certain calculations upstream whenever possible, you can gain some real efficiencies. I'll create my main function, and to get my transform position, I'll just use the magic of linear algebra and multiply my projection matrix against my position. I actually only care about the X and Z values, and we'll add the Y values later. This one here at the end helps us make the linear algebra math work out. Man, the wizards who created linear algebra were geniuses. To do all this by normal methods would have been awful. And last but not least, let's hard code our color variable that we're passing down to the fragment shader for now. This will come into play later in the video. Okay, that's it for the shader for now. Let's add this to our mod. For our fragment, we'll be receiving color from the vertex shader just like we did with the gradient. So I'm going to reuse that. I'm going to rename the shader to varying color from vertex. Let's fix our mod. And because of the renaming, I need to go fix my 2D gradient program. Let's confirm this can still run. Yep, looks good. Now we can leverage the existing fragment shader. Keep in mind that sharing code is a double-edged sword. I do it when it's convenient, but as soon as I need something more specialized, I don't try to get fancy in handling multiple different scenarios in a single shader. At that point, I'll just create a different shader and be done with it. But in this case, sharing works perfectly fine. Now that we have our shaders, let's create our graph3d program file. I'm going to paste in some using statements that I know we'll need. 
From our vertex shader, it looks like I'll need a position attribute, a projection matrix uniform, and from our fragment shader, it looks like I'll need an opacity uniform. So let's create our struct that'll hold our information. I'll need the program pointer, of course. I'll add my position buffer, which is a pointer to the position attribute data we'll be providing. I'll also get the uniform locations for both the opacity and projection matrix. Great. Now, because I'm going to be drawing in the more efficient draw elements method instead of the draw arrays, I'll need the indices buffer and the index count. Okay, so if you watched the previous video, so far this should feel somewhat familiar. I'm not gonna say you're an expert on this just because you watched my previous video. It takes a lot of time and effort to get all this. These concepts are not easy, so don't beat yourself up if there's a bit of confusion at this point. This is a very hard topic, but if you keep at it, eventually the puzzle pieces start to fall into place. Moving on, I'll implement our new constructor, and initialize some WebGL stuff. Let's create our WebGL program. Remember that we set up some helper functions in our common funks area, so I'll utilize that. I'll pass in the graphics layer, the vertex shader, and the fragment shader. Let's now assign the program variable to our struct. The uniforms are easy. All we need to do is get the location of the input variables, and during our render, we'll shove data into them. Hence the name, Uniforms the Game. A uniform is uniformly available throughout both the vertex and fragment shader for whatever calculations you need. They don't have to be used if you don't want, and you're unable to mutate them, but if a uniform is what you need, it's an efficient way of passing in data. I put them above the program because both of these need to borrow the program before the ownership is transferred to the struct. For the position and indices, creating a grid by hand would be difficult, tedious, and error prone. If my grid was 100 by 100, that's 20,000 different triangles. I'm actually going to be systematic about this. I'll create a new function in the common funks area that takes the size of the grid we want and returns two variables, one that represents our position data and one that represents our indices for our final triangles to draw. I'm using vectors instead of arrays because arrays would have to be a fixed size at compile time. Vectors give me a little more flexibility in this situation. So if I had a two by two grid, I really need an array of three by three because I have the two starting points plus the last endpoint. If I had a grid with 3x3 three three squares, I would need an array of 4x4, four four, and so on. That means we need to have an n plus 1 represented by a variable. This grid will be a square, so the number of rows and columns will be the same. Yeah, we could have literally done the math n plus 1 everywhere we we're going to need it. It's just cleaner with the variable though. So let's default a vector to be big enough to hold our resultant vertex position data. I'll default them to zero. For every vertex, I need an X, Y, and Z, so I'll need three data elements. And I need N plus one in the X direction times N plus one in the Z direction. So really, for a two by two square, I'll have 27 floats representing our vertex position information. Since the Y value will really be determined later, you could have shaved this off by a third and make this a two you could have been more efficient with your memory. Feel free to see if you can alter the program if you'd like to try it out. Just remember that your vertex shader is expecting data in a certain way, so there will need to be some massaging there. Just a hint. Anyways, I'm gonna stick with representing y's in this vector simply because it's easier for me to wrap my head around an x, y, z value than an x, z value. I'll also default the indices to tell it what triangles to draw. In this case, we need six vertices per square. So we'll multiply six 
times n times n. I'll set my graph layout width to 2. This is really arbitrary. I'm just mimicking what WebGL does from going negative 1 to positive 1. But nothing's forcing me to do that because we're transforming our position points anyways. Eh, whatever. I could be convinced there's a better system, so don't take this as gospel. Only something I chose to do on a whim. To get how big each of our squares are, all I need to do is divide the width by the number of squares. Okay, let's loop through our possible z values. And inside that, we'll loop through the possible x values. This will establish a grid. We'll need to know a position of the array we're starting at for each iteration. Since we have three data points per vertex, I'll multiply 3 by z times n plus 1 to cover what row we're on, and then add x. Hmm, I wonder why I'm getting an error. Oh, I'm not returning the data from the function yet. Now it looks like I defined the wrong data type for the indices vector, so I'll change that to u16s. Okay, now we're cooking with gas. I'll use that starting point to create our x value. Our y value is always going to be 0. Again, you can make this more efficient if you wanted. And then our z value. So far what we've done is cut up the universe that goes from negative 1 to positive 1 into n pieces for the x and z directions. But the vertices are not sufficient for our drawing needs. We also need to populate the indices array to represent triangles based on those vertices. Since our z and x iterators are zero based, I need to make sure if either are equal to n that I don't do the calculations. Our starting index i is simply going to be 6 because we have 6 indices per square to represent both triangles times z times n plus x. The top left vertex is going to be z times n plus 1 and then add x. We're making it a u16 because that's what WebGL will expect. The bottom left is in the same column but in a new row. So we just add n plus 1 to pop it to the next row. The top right is going to be a little easier. We just take our top left and add 1. And the bottom right is similar. We just take the bottom left and add 1. For our triangles, if I add the vertices of our square and I number the vertices like so, to create our triangles, I'm going to go from uh, 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 3. When we did the two-dimensional triangles, we had a slightly different pattern. I'm going this way to show you that it doesn't really matter what order you go in. It only matters that your triangles are created in a counterclockwise fashion. The square is not a square, it's two triangles. Anyways, let's do this. The first index will be our top left. I'm just going to copy that and make five more copies. Let me fix the array index. Okay, and second will be the bottom left. And the third will be bottom right. That completes one triangle of our grid square. The second starts from the top left again, goes to the bottom right, and then ends on the top right. Back in our program, we can now use this function to create a grid with as much granularity as we like. Let's create a grid with 10 squares in the x and z directions. Using that information, we can now create our buffer. Let's ask WebAssembly to create a memory buffer. I'll get the pointer of the vertices memory location. From there, we'll shove our data into the vertice array that JavaScript can understand. I'll create my actual position buffer.
Bind it to WebGL to get it ready to shove data into. And then finally shove our data into the static drop. Now that we have that buffered, let's store the buffer position pointer so that we can hook it up during our render. For those of you who haven't watched my previous video, you may be thinking this is super ugly, and it is. Binding data so that WebGL can use it is not a pretty sight, but after you do it a few times, it becomes patternistic, so really you get used to it, but admittedly, it ugly. Let's buffer our indices, and once again we'll be doing a very similar process. We ask WebAssembly to create a memory buffer. Get the pointer location. Shove our data into an array that JavaScript will understand. Create a buffer to finally hold our index information. Bind our buffer as an element array buffer, which is specifically meant for index information. And then finally shove our data into the buffer. And now let's store the buffer indices pointers so that we can hook it up during our render. And I'll also store the index count for convenience later on. Okay, so the constructor is set up. Now let's move on to the render. On top of needing the data I've stored my own struct, I'll need the graphics layer reference. I'll also bring in the control dimensions on the XY plane that we did in the 2D drawings. I'll bring in the bottom, top, left and right. These will be used so that I can match exactly my location on the 2D control. And to correctly orientate things on screen, I'll also need the canvas height and width. Eventually I'll want to rotate our object. So let's bring in some rotation angles for the X and the Y axis. First thing we're going to do is tell WebGL we're using this 3D program. Before we go any further, we'll need to create our projection matrix, which is quite involved. Since I would probably use this in multiple locations, I'll create it in our common funks area. So let's create our function. I'll pass in our bottom, top, left, and right, as well as our canvas height and width. And I'll pass in our rotation angles. I'll be returning an array of F32s with 16 entries representing a faux 4x4 matrix. This will do all sorts of scaling, translations, rotations, and 3D perspective all in a single matrix. I'll need to establish some constants. I'll need a field of view meaning how big of an angle does your eyeball see. I'll set it to 45 degrees, which is pretty standard, and then convert it to radians. I'll set the Z far and the Z near constants, meaning how far and how close can you see. The reason these are useful is because if, in our universe, we gaze at the stars in any given direction, we'd see an infinite number of stars and planets so that WebGL can make a reasonable guess as to where it's okay to stop rendering distant objects, it allows you to set that distance. Same goes for items that are too close to you. It's really for efficiency purposes. And I'll set my z-plane about 2.41 away from me, which I use some trigonometry to figure out based on our 45 degree angle field of view. 
This will move my 3D graph away from me to be a precise distance needed to match up with our two-dimensional screen layout. I'll be able to incorporate my 3D objects into a two-dimensional UI layout. I'll show you what I mean later. Let's do the X rotation first. I'll create an F32 array. This matrix is well-defined. I didn't come up with this stuff on my own. It'll define how to rotate our 3D object around the X axis. I'll speed up the video so that you don't have to watch me type. So I tried to make it look like it's the 4x4 matrix that it represents, but it's still just an array. I'll also create the matrix for rotating around our Y axis. This matrix is also well defined in mathematics. I didn't just make this stuff up. To combine the two, I'll use our linear algebra matrix multiplication function I created in the previous video. Now the resultant matrix has packed both transformations into one. Let's now move to the translation matrix. For that, I'll need to calculate my aspect ratio, which is just the canvas width divided by the canvas height. I'll get my scale X, and my scale Y values. And I'll set my generic scale to the Y scale. We'll leverage the translation matrix we defined in the previous video. This will help center things to match up with our 2D layout. I'll do the X translation. The Y translation. And we already calculated our Z translation when we did Z plane, so we'll just do that. For those of you familiar with WebGL, you may be wondering why I did my translation matrix like this. In particular, why am I using scale value? I'm making our 3D world mesh with our 2D layout so that they can look integrated together. If all I had was a 3D world and I didn't need to constrain by a 2D layout, this funky math wouldn't be necessary. Now that we have our matrix that moves our objects into the correct spot, we then need to scale it. Again, I'll use the function we created in the other video. We already have our full rotation matrix. Now let's combine it with our scale matrix. And now let's combine it with our translation matrix. So you might be noticing a pattern. We create simple matrices representing different transforms. Sometimes it's scaling or rotating or translating, etc. Then we combine the matrices by multiplying them. The last but not least transform we need to do is the perspective matrix, which gives it the 3D feel. For this, I'm gonna cheat. It too is a well-defined matrix in linear algebra, but it's kind of hairy. For the next section, I'll need to use something called Perspective 3 from NAlgebra. I'll create our Perspective 3 based on the aspect ratio, field of view, Z near, and Z far. We'll need a variable to dump the results into, so let's create a mutable perspective array and default it to zeros. And from there, we just tell it to copy the result matrix into our variable. Now that we have that, all we need to do is multiply our existing combined transform with our new perspective matrix. We leave off the seven colon at the end to represent this is what's returning from our function. It turned yellow because we haven't used it yet. Back in our program, I'll call our function to get our finalized projection matrix. I'll enter in all the dimensions it needs to get the job done. Now that we have that, we can populate our projection uniform. 
Let's also fill in our opacity uniform. At the moment, I'm just hard coding it to one. Typically, I would hook this up to some input variable. Let's bind our position buffer. Make sure the attribute pointer is set. I talked more about what's going on here in the 2D video if you want to learn more about what I'm currently doing. And then enable the attribute. And now let's give the go ahead to draw our object. Okay, I think we're ready to hook this up to the lip. Let's go to the mod and make sure it's exposed. Whoops, looks like I have a compile error in my Graph3D. Ah, I'm missing an angle bracket. Okay, back on track. Let's go to the lib file and finish hooking this up. In Doug's client, let's add our program. We'll initialize it on startup. Now let's call our render with the other renders. I'll copy and paste our color 2D, change the name, and add a couple of zeros to represent our dummy rotations for our X and Y axis. And I'm gonna disable the gradient so that we have less to look at. And so that I don't constantly have to see warnings, I'm gonna annotate our gradient definition with allow dead code. Let's also put an underscore in front of the program in Dugstruct to get rid of the warning. Okay, I think I'm ready to run this. So it doesn't look like anything is there besides the square we drew earlier, but that's because we're drawing on the XZ plane for the 3D graph and we're looking at its edge. If I manually give it some angles, we'll be able to see something. Okay, so that's not so beautiful yet, but let's keep moving. I want to be able to move this with our mouse. In order to do that, I'll need to maintain mouse state. So in our app state, we're going to add some data. I want to keep track of my mouse button is down, what the current mouse X and the mouse Y are, and then store what our rotations are for our 3D object for the x-axis and y-axis. And I'll provide the initial values for each. I'll give it an initial rotation angle so that's turned in such a way that it's visible when we start the program. And now that we have data sitting in our app state, let's use that inside of our render call. I'll create a function to update our mouse down. This will be the easier of the two. I'll feed in parameters for the mouse X, Y, and if the mouse is down. All I do is get a lock on our app state, and then I provide a new arc with the is down, X, and Y values set. The Y value has to be inverted because the browser thinks of the top of the screen as zero and increases as you go down the screen. That's always felt a bit goofy footed to me, so I reverse that where my Y increases as you go up the screen. I'll clone the remaining fields of the app state. I'll also create a function to update our mouse position. I'll have the X and Y passed in and I'll lock my app state while I update my data. We'll get our inverted Y, which will then allow me to calculate my Y delta. I'll then create variables for both my X and Y deltas. And for the rotation X delta, I'll wrap it in an if statement to only record a delta if the mouse is down. And from there, I just need to record how much we need to rotate. Now, the rotation X delta actually depends on the Y value. It's kind of hard to visualize, 
it rotates around its X axis, so to speak, when you pull it up or down. And if the mouse isn't down, we just don't alter the rotation. Let's do the same for the rotation Y delta. It's gonna be altered by mouse movements that are left or right, or in other words, affected by the X delta. And again, if our mouse isn't down, we're just not gonna rotate. And now we just record our values. Mouse X, mouse Y, rotation X axis, rotation Y axis, and at the end, I'll clone the rest of the app state. Okay, let's close that up. To record mouse events, we'll need to go into the GL setup file. I know I'll need a use statement, so let's do that right now. Let's create a handler that takes care of our mouse down. The input will be the HTML canvas, and we'll return a result of JS value. We'll need to represent a handler as a closure. Inside of that closure, we'll update our app state. I'll pass in the client X and client Y. I'll box it up. And then let the canvas know to listen for our event. If it sees the event, it'll call our closure. And now tell the handler to forget it. Huh? Yep, Rust is much more strict with memory management than JavaScript. And what's really going on is that we're communicating our closure to JavaScript so that it knows what to call when the event happens. If we don't tell Rust to forget about this function, it'll clean up the memory once this function ends. To make it long lived in the JavaScript world, we need to tell Rust it's okay that this will not be cleaned up. It's essentially doing a mini memory leak on purpose, but it's a tiny leak that doesn't get bigger over time, and this is how we can ensure JavaScript can inform us of events. At the bottom, I'll just return the okay result. We'll also do one for mouse up. I'm just gonna copy our mouse down and change a couple of things. Uh, this goes to up, same with this, and this goes to false. Okay, that was easy. We also need one for mouse move. I'll type this one out, but I'll speed up the video for you. With those in place, let's actually call our functions to hook up our events. Attach our down. Attach our up. and our move. Looks like I have a compile error. Ah, I have one too many parentheses. In theory, we should be good to go. And now when I click down, I can rotate the graph left or right, up or down. Okay, great, progress. Earlier I mentioned the Z value to be negative 2.41 away from us on the Z axis. The reason I did that is so that when we rotate our graph, it will perfectly fit the 2D control. So really I can combine a 2D layout with 3D graphs. That's nice if you have a grid full of graphs that you wanna show. It's just a bit of trigonometry to calculate the value based on a 45 degree angle or any angle really. Okay, so now we have our flat graph surface that we can rotate. I think it's time to add some Y values. What do you think? Yeah? Okay then. In our vertex shader, we're gonna pass in our attribute for Y. And instead of hard coding in a zero for the Y, let's use our new Y value. You might be wondering why I just wouldn't use our Y values of a position. That data is buffered once and only once. I need something that will be dynamically updated. So I'm just adding this attribute separately. 
Could we dynamically update our attribute position each time instead of the Y values? Sure, but that means we're rebuffering a lot of data that will never change over and over again. The choice is yours as a programmer on how to best provide data to your shaders. And that's the point. You have much more control, which allows you to be much more efficient if necessary, or much more versatile when you're doing your drawings. Control, control, control. In our Graph3D program, we'll need a new buffer for our Y values. And all we'll do in the constructor is create our buffer because we'll be populating it during our render because it's dynamic in nature, not static. We'll need to augment our render to accept the Y values as a vector of F32s. In the render section, we'll do our boilerplate binding and enabling of our attribute buffer. We've done this part so many times right now, it should be old hat. We'll set our attribute pointer for attribute index of one and enable attribute one. And now let's buffer our Y data. This is extremely similar to how we buffered our original grid array, so I'll speed up the video. The main difference is that we have a dynamic draw here instead of static. Earlier when we created our grid, we had hard-coded a size of 10, but we'll need that information in more places than just here, so let's refactor. I think it's time to create a constants file. In there, let's put a constant for grid size. I'll also move our constants we had in our common functions over here. I'll make sure they're public and in alphabetical order. In our lib, I'll make our constant file visible. In our common funks, I'll use those constants because they will be used within our new function. While I'm here, we'll create a new function to give us our updated 3D Y values. I'll need to know the point count per row, which is just the grid size plus one. And let's default a vector large enough to cover our grid. And just as a simple test, I'll update a single one of our values so that at least we can verify our data is being used. And now in our lib file, let's use that function and feed it into our graph 3D render. Let's run it and see what we get. Okay, so we see a little spike here because of the one Y value we hard coded, which is what I wanted to see. It's kind of hard to see the 3D effect at this point because there's a lack of shading. But as I move it around, you should be able to get a sense of it. If I make it such that we're viewing it straight on, you can see the tippy top matches the top of the 2D graph. Also, if you make one of the points negative, it will go to the bottom. I made it such that our graph space is its own little mini negative one to positive one universe. Now that was arbitrary on my end. You make your layout system whatever you like. I'm gonna use a cheap trick to help us visualize better. If the Y value is greater than zero, I'll make it greenish depending on its height. If it's less than zero, I'll make it reddish depending on its height. Okay, now you might be able to see the 3D effect a little better. We can do much better than this, but I wanted to focus on getting our Y values done before tackling that. The grid size of 10 by 10 isn't gonna be granular enough to see a nice round sine wave. So I'm gonna increase that to 100. Hmm, okay, that did nothing. Let's go check if I replaced my hard-coded 10. Ah, sure enough. Let's replace that with our constant. Okay, that's better. We can see that our graph now is a much finer granularity. If you haven't guessed, really our graph can be used to graph anything. But my goal is to do a sine wave, so let's see how we can do that. I'll just keep this running while I make my changes. <laughs> 
I'd like the origin to be the center of our graph, so I'll need the halfway point. I'll also need our frequency. And for now, we're going to scale the Y values all the way to the top and bottom, so the Y scale is 1. From there, I'll just loop through all possible Z values. And inside that, all possible X values. I'll need the Y index of the vector to point to, so we just take Z times point count per row and add X. From there, to get our X and Z scaled values, we just use the frequency and multiply by the distance from the halfway point, and then divide by the halfway size. Let's do the same thing for Z. Really, this is just doing a rough calculation of how far the sine wave rings should be from each other. And from there, we just use the Pythagorean theorem to find the scale distance from the center and take the sine of that. Oops, looks like I got a compile error. I forgot to cast my integer to an F32. My bad. If some or all of that didn't make sense to you, hey, don't worry about it. I'm just throwing sample graph data into Y values. You can create whatever graph you like. Perhaps your data is coming from some raw data from a database to represent real information, and you don't need to do any calcs. The sine wave and its math are really arbitrary just to get something recognizable on the screen. So don't be too concerned if this section is confusing. Okay, so now we have a little more involved 3D graph. I'm going to change the default angle so that it's facing towards us. As you'll notice, I can still fit it inside the 2D layout if I position it right. When I turn it, it will spill over, but that's because half the 3D graph is closer to you than the 2D plane. I kind of like that effect, but if you truly wanted to bound it to the 2D layout, you can simply push it away from you in the Z direction by another 1.7673, and you can ensure your 3D graph will always stay in bounds. As you can see, now when I turn the entire graph, it stays in our 2D layout. You can calculate that number by using trigonometry and knowledge that the possibilities of the graph are a cube, and the furthest distance is the opposite corners of the cube. That's not really the point of this video though, and I kind of like the effect of the 3D graph overlapping its boundaries, so I'm going to put it back. Okay, so our graph is a little extreme at this point, and I'm going to dial it down a little. I'm going to make the height 15% of the max. It looks a little dull now because it's not reaching high enough to be colorful. So let's increase our brightness by a factor of 5. Okay, that's a little better. Let's play around with the frequency. Let's amp it up to 10. Oh, interesting. Notice that as we get more granular in our graph, flaws start to appear. I'm going to ramp up the grid size to 200, and that should smooth things out. Okay, that's better. The grid size isn't unlimited. Not only do you have to worry about performance, I mean, we're drawing 80,000 triangles right now every render, which is crazy, but at some point WebGL is just not capable. If you can't get a high quality graph out of 200 by 200, then I don't know what Pixar film you're trying to create, but it's probably not right for the browser. Okay, I'm going to dial our grid size back to 100 and put our frequency back to 3. I'm not really happy with the initial angle. I, I don't know, I kind of like it facing to the right for some reason, so I'm going to do that. Okay, great. Now we have something looking more like our finished product, but I want to do a more realistic coloring and shading. I'm going to want things to be colored as if there was a light over my left shoulder. Let's close this down for now. This is where complexity is going to be ramped up, but I think it's going to be a really nice effect. In our vertex shader, I'll bring in what's called normal values. This data will allow us to detect if triangles are facing towards the light or away from the light. We'll also need to bring in the rotations so that we can apply it to our normal attributes. So, as our object rotates, things will move in and out of the direction of the light. 
This is fine as a uniform. If one atom in our object is rotated a certain amount, then all atoms in our object are rotated that same amount, so it's fine to have a rotation matrix that's uniform because it's uniformly applied. I'm gonna delete our old color calculation. I'm gonna define an ambient light, meaning how light is something if it doesn't have direct light on it. If you like crisp definition, you can set it lower. In a very bright room, set it higher. I'm gonna set it to 0.2 for the red, green, and blue. And that will give us some shadow effect to really make the 3D stand out. I'm gonna set the color of the directional light to white, which is one, one, and one. If you had a fire providing your light, you might wanna make it a yellowish orange to give it an added effect. With the ambient and directional colors, you can actually get a two-tone effect. I'll stick with vanilla for this example though. I'll define the direction of my light source, which has an X, Y, and Z of negative 8.5, 0 0.8, and 0 0.75. In essence, that would be above your left shoulder. But you can put it anywhere you like. We need to do a little linear algebra. Take the normal rotations we'll be passing in and multiply it by the vertex normal. This will find whether the vertex is facing towards the light or not, so it knows if it needs to highlight it. We're going to combine that with our directional vector with a dot product to determine a final directional value. And to get the color based on lighting, we just take the ambient light and add it to the directional color times the directional value we just created. I'm gonna define a base color that has just a splash of blue in it. Not too much to overwhelm the effect. Okay, the last thing to do is combine our base color with our lighting color. I'm adding one to say this color is fully opaque. That opacity can be modified in the fragment shader if we like. Okay, so I admit that may have been a bit much. Much of this code is explained in detail at the following tutorial created by Mozilla regarding WebGL. I used some of their snippets to help me get up and running. Mozilla really deserves a lot of credit, and not just for creating Rust, but for the WebGL tutorials they created as well. That should be it for our shaders. The fragment shader doesn't need to be touched, but we still have some work to do in Rust. Specifically, we need to provide the attribute for the vertex normal, as well as the uniform for the rotations. In my program, I'll create a field for our normals buffer. I'm also gonna create a uniform location for our normals rotation. In the constructor, I'm just gonna create our normals buffer because we'll be dynamically filling it in during our render. I'm also gonna get the location of our uniform normals rotation. We've already calculated our rotation in the common function of get3d projection matrix. I'm gonna augment that to also return our normals rotation. So I'm gonna rename this to get3d matrices. I could make this a tuple, but I don't think that someone else using the function will know what my data represents per field. So I'm gonna make it an explicit struct to represent our data. Uh, let's make it alphabetical. And I'll use that for our return type. I'll create a mutable return bar and default them with zeros. And instead of just returning our projection matrix, let's set it to our return bar. At the end, we'll just return our return bar. Now, obviously we have to refactor the code calling this function, but let's stay here and finish this up first. Then we'll go fix the calling code. I'm gonna use another goodie from our N-Algebra crate, specifically a matrix four. The reason being is that it has an inverse functionality that I can use so that I don't have to do it by hand. So we're gonna take our rotation matrix, which we've actually set as an array, and shove it into their special data type. 
I'll speed up the video a little. I don't know if this is the best way to initialize the matrix 4 from an array, but it's the way I got it to work. So the reason I did this is that we actually need the normals of the rotation, not the rotations, which is going to be achieved through the inverse. Since we have our matrix 4, I can try to use the try inverse function. If it's successful, I'll shove that data into our normals rotation. Great. Now let's get back to our graph 3D program and fix the refactoring errors. Let's change the name of our function to match the definition. And instead of calling it projection matrix, let's call it my 3D matrices. Rust doesn't let you name a variable beginning with a number, so that's why I had to prepend it with my. Okay, let's fix this compile error using our new variable. And now that we have our normals rotation, let's hook that up too. Let's go back to our common funks because unfortunately we still have more work to do. For any given triangle, I'm going to need a way to calculate the normal vector for that. I'll create a function called getNormalVec. I need to pass in the x, y, and z values of all three points. I'm going to call my points a, b, and c. From there, we'll return a tuple with three F32s. I'm going to speed up the video a little. All I'm doing is the math to find the normal vector of a triangle. There may be a built-in way to do this with N algebra, but I just decided to bang it out real quick. Now we're going to use this to find all normals for the entire grid. I'm going to start a function called getGridNormals. We'll pass in the grid size along with our y values. I'll start by creating a variable to hold the points per row as we'll be using that for multiple places. We'll also define our graph layout width as 2. And each square size is going to be the graph layout width divided by n. Let's create our return var and default its size to be large enough to hold our return data. At the bottom, I'll return my return var. Like we've done before, I'll loop through the z and x values. I'll create a variable for our y value index of our point A, and then create an index for our return var vectors. Be aware that this calculation is just going to be a simplified version. To get a vertex normal, you might want to get some type of average of all the normals of the triangles touching it. I'm just going to approximate it by just using a calculation of one of the triangles touching it. If your granularity is fine enough, the approximation should be pretty close. If you want more precision, you'd probably want to do more calculations. In our edge case scenario, I'm just going to default it to 1. On our graph, we might see a slight edge because of this on the ends of the graph. But again, if you go through more calcs, you should be able to smooth that out. For my purposes, it's not going to be too noticeable. For the actual calculations, we'll need our y vector index values for points b and point c. I'll prep the x values that I'll need, which is just the square size times the x value. And the second x value is just taking the first and adding the square size. I'll do the same for our z values. And now I'm ready to call our function getNormalVec using the values we created to define our triangle.
And now we'll populate our return var with our normals. Hmm. Now that I look at it, I don't think I needed all the X and Z calculations. Oh well, this video is going mega overtime as it is and the calcs still work. So I'll let you make it more efficient if you like. Let's use our new function to populate our normals buffer. First, we need to bind our normals buffer. Set the vertex attribute pointer. and enable it. And now let's get our values from the function we just created. Create a buffer. Get a pointer to our vector information. Get it in a JavaScript form. Bind our normals buffer. And finally, shove our data into the buffer as dynamic data. Let's see how that looks. Okay, very nice. You can now see that there's a lighting effect as if it's coming from a light over my left shoulder. And as I spin it around, the shadows adjust accordingly based on the rotation. If I make it vertical, you can see it perfectly fills our 2D layout. Let's make the sine wave move now. To do that, all I need to do is offset the sine wave based on the current time. I'll go in the common funks file and modify the get updated 3D Y values. Let's put an offset. Okay, looking good. Let's make this semi-transparent by altering the opacity. And now it's like a ghosty. Let's change that back to one and reduce the granularity. You can now see some flaws, but not too bad for a 20 by 20 grid. Let's see how much this is taxing my computer. In reality, that's not too bad. Focus on the Firefox line as that's where we're running this. A 20 by 20 grid is rendering 800 triangles per render, including all the math to calculate the 3D perspective and our colors based on shading. Our CPU usage is only about 1%, and our GPU usage is around 8%. Let's see what happens when I ramp it up to 100 by 100. That will result in 20,000 triangles drawn every render. Quite the jump from 800. It does have an increase, but not a huge amount. The CPU usage goes to around 3% or so, and our GPU is bouncing around 8%. Let's ramp that up to 200 by 200. That will be 80,000 triangles per render. Do you think it can do it? So we're still not horrible. The CPU takes a greater hit than the GPU. If you wanted this to scale better, you might think of ways to offload calculations done in Rust directly, which is done by the CPU, and calculate them in the shaders, which is done by the GPU. It's a balancing act though. There's no one golden rule to make WebGL work better or faster. 
It depends on what you're drawing, and there are always trade-offs. My computer is a decent computer, but it's no powerhouse. But keep in mind if your users are going to be hitting your site with a phone or tablet, this could be a drain on their battery and push the limits of their hardware. Just keep that in mind when you're designing stuff. Okay, I'm going to put that back to 100. I'm also going to disable the teal square in the background before posting this to GitHub. The code will still be there, just like the 2D gradient, but it just won't be hooked up. I also reserve the right to make minor bug fixes or enhancements if needed, but really, I'll try not to monkey with this so that it matches the video as much as possible. I'm sure this can be made much more efficient, and perhaps you have better ideas about how to do this, or have ideas on special effects you could do. I encourage you to explore, tinker, and get your hands dirty. That's really the only way you learn. I just did this so that you could have some example as a springboard. This is not the last word on the topic, only a starting point. Lastly, I want to give a final shout out again to webglfundamentals.org and the Mozilla training site. Fantastic resources that you should really check out. Well kids, that was fun. I hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly had fun making it. Once again, my name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley and I'll see you next time.